I think it might be appropriate to ask, why you, Edwin? That is a good question. And I lean that back to how I was converted to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That changed my life in a way that I never had any idea could happen. I did not know God was that powerful. I did not know that you can go through a conversion so radical. So I'd like to tell you a little about that story. Uh, go back a little bit in history first, if you don't mind. My uh, great-great-grandpa lived in Missouri. He was a man of no nonsense, and he had a philosophy. And the philosophy was, if you spoil the child, it's because you spare the rod. And he didn't believe in that, so he beat his kids. And obedience was number one in his book. My great-grandpa left that home when he was 14 years old, and he never came back. 14! Unfortunately, he took a lot of things with him from his father. He was cooled. He was remote. He didn't express himself well. He didn't express love well. He was a workaholic and kind of filled in all the gaps. And he passed it to my grandpa, who passed it to my dad. Now, my dad was a heck of a guy. He was amazing in a lot of ways. When he was first married, he was in his mid-20s. He was ready to get a house, first house. And he built it from scratch, from the bottom up, a thousand foot house, poured the cement, did the walls, did the sheetrock, did the plumbing, did the electrical, did the roofing, everything. He could fix cars, he could take things apart, he could put things together. Very, very handy blue collar man. So he worked at a blue collar job 40 hours a week. Uh, we were raised on a little farm outside of Sacramento, California, and it was a rundown old farm. Perfect for him. He'd come home and work another 40 hours on the farm. If he get his hands on my brother and I, we worked with him. Worked to find him. Uh, it made him happy. He didn't care for people, didn't care much for anything other than work. He did, really did to find him. So for me, that had a profound effect over time. Uh, as a young boy, uh, I knew I was missing something with my dad. So he never touched us, never hugged us, never kissed us, never loved us in a way I could absorb. In those days, I didn't really know what to expect. I just wanted more. I knew that. I wanted something, affection, love. I, I don't know if I could have even identified it at that time. So we were going through life. I was nine. My brother was six. We had an experience that really kind of solidified all these feelings for me at nine. Uh, I walked into our, our garage on the farm. It was a big garage, about 30 by 40, so 1,200 feet full of equipment, cars, and my dad worked on all of them. He was in working on a particular car. We walked in, we sat down. We didn't say anything, he didn't say anything, we were just watching. And for the first time in my life, my dad asked me to do something that was revelatory. He said, Eddie, Give me this kind of wrench. He never taught me how a wrench even was. I had no clue, but I walked over to the, I was so excited because he asked me to do something. I walked over to the bench where all the tools were. It's about eight by four, so big, lots of tools, almost a mound of tools. I didn't know what he wanted. I just wanted to please him. I wanted to make him happy with me. So I grabbed the tool, it looked good. I brought it back. I said, here, daddy. He looked at it and he frowned and said, it's the wrong one, get out of here. And never for the rest of my life and my brother's life did he ever show us how to do any of those things he could do. Not once. Not once. So, life was a strange thing. But it was about to change. At that time, my brother and I with my mom went to the Baptist church because it was the closest church to us. We were out in the, in the country. My mom took me into our doctor for a checkup. We walked out. The doctor says, Mrs. Patterson, I don't know if you know this or not, but I'm a Mormon. Would you like to know more about the Mormon church? And she said, yes. I, I never heard the word. I didn't know what a Mormon was. I didn't know anything about what he was talking about. He said, well, we're having a uh, cottage meeting at my house this week. Would you and your husband like to come? And she said, yes, again. And I'm thinking, nine years old. How is she going to get him to go to that? Because in our home, 
There was no religion. We never, there was no Bible. We didn't read the Bible, didn't talk of spiritual things. We didn't pray. No evidence of a godly life in our home. But the time came and he went. Now later on, I found this out. It was really amazing to me. My mom died a sad, sad death at 55 years old. At that funeral, she, or my dad told me why he went to this particular fireside or this, this cottage meeting about the Mormons. He said, Eddie, all I really wanted to do was see what our rich man's, a more rich woman's house looked like. And I, if he'd have said that at nine, I'd go, yeah, that, that's you, buddy, I, I know that. So he went, they sat there, and there were a group of people, most of them were patients of the doctor. They brought out two missionaries, and the missionaries started talking. All my dad heard was everything he believed in was wrong, and he got torqued off. He had a massive, massive ego, very unhealthy ego, vain pride. So he knew what he was gonna do. He stood up, everyone looked at him, he grabbed my mom's hand and dragged her out. He was done with the Mormons. The doctor didn't give up. He called my mom the next week, apologized, sorry we offended your husband. Listen, would you just come back and have dinner with us? And back they came. But this time the missionaries are gone. There were no missionaries. There was two old ladies that were on the other side of the, of the table. They were stake missionaries and they were mature women. They knew what they were doing. And they were talking, you know, getting to know each other. And one woman said to my dad, Edwin, did you know that the Mormons believe that families could be together forever? And amazingly, that was the only thing anybody could have told my dad to gain his interest. Because in his head, now, none of us knew that. Maybe my mom did, I don't know, but I didn't. None of my, my siblings knew it. My dad had a beef with God. Why would I want to go to heaven without my family that I love? <laughs> we didn't even know he loved us, let alone what well, they thought about heaven. And so he said, maybe I should look into this. I'd check this out. This is 1960, and in 1960, you had to investigate the church for a year. You couldn't just say, hey, this feels good, let's go, and let's get baptized, a year. And so he decided in that year, and he's a true blue-collar guy, he almost didn't get through high school, took no college. He started studying different religions, and he only would study what people would give him, no anti-anything. So whether it's the Seventh-day Adventists or the Methodists, he just started looking at everyone. What is true out there? It was pretty amazing, really, to, to see this guy do this. At the end of a year, my mother, my father, and I were baptized into the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I was 10 years old. And for me, having been a Baptist, now a Mormon, a lot of it was the same. I, I went to church, I was a quiet little guy, uh, so a lot of it was the same to me. I didn't really know we made a big transition. Uh, but during that time, Growing up into teenage years, uh, I started to do something that was, I didn't know was troubling at the time, but it became very troubling later on. I really wanted affection and I attributed it to my father. I may be right, I may be wrong, I don't know. But I wanted people to like me and I wanted to show them their like for me. So I would listen to people and if I could tell what they were interested in, I would become that interest. For example, they were talking about baseball. Oh, I play baseball. Yes, I love baseball. It's a great game. And I never played baseball in my life but I would lie to make them want to like me. And I would do it for this and for this and for this. Oh yes, I'm, uh, I know how to fix cars and I, I knew nothing about cars. But it got people to pay attention to me and maybe be friendly towards me. Well, that's very unhealthy and it's sick. I know that now, then I thought it was just what I was doing. So through high school, I exhibited some of these ailments, maladies. I went on a mission. I was a good missionary. I wanted to be a good missionary. I, I loved people. I enjoyed my mission, but exhibited it on my mission. Went into marriage doing that. It actually became a mental illness. I couldn't control it. It became a compulsion. I've been to jail because of it. We fired from jobs. business bankruptcy because I couldn't be honest. It was getting worse and worse. We had four children. They weren't really aware of it. My wife absolutely was. We were married in the temple. She expected a certain 
experience. She didn't get that. She got a poor experience from me. I had so many problems, and they were becoming worse, deeper and deeper. Finally, when I was 43 years old. So we'd been married in 1977, and this is 1995. She came to me on the 4th of July weekend in our bedroom. I'm getting dressed for the day. Brings our four children in. The oldest is 12 or 13 on down. Says, Edward, I have to leave you if you can't change. Now, I tried to be different than my dad. I told my kids I loved them, and I did. But I knew I was broken. And that brokenness caused me a lot of problem with, with my relationship with God and Christ. Because here's how I thought about it. How can they love me like I am? I know what I am. I am not the man I appear to be. I have lots of problems inside, and they're getting worse. And now my wife will leave me if I can't get better. I'd been to psychiatrists and psychologists. I'd taken pills. I'd gone to therapy. Nothing had touched this malady. It was deeply rooted now. So I started it when I was about 10-ish. So I was 43 now, 33 years to develop a rigid adherence to this mental illness. It was horrible, it was horrible. I didn't know what to say, I didn't know what to do. And so like a chicken, I ran away. I ran up behind my house and some hills. I followed a stream up into there. Went as far as I could go, sat down, I cried. It was all pity, self-pity. I Again, what was I going to do? I tried everything to, to fix myself. Nothing seemed to work. And now my family was in jeopardy. I started to think, I don't know where you're at, Father. But if ever, could you now do something? Help me please, somehow. I really didn't know what to expect. I really didn't have a relationship with Father because I'd kept at a distance. I didn't want people to know me very well because of my problems. I didn't know, I thought God was marginalized. He'd go help people who were worthy, not me. And so I was distant from him. The creek was in front of us. I thought, maybe if I would just put myself into the water, like a rebaptism, a rededication to him, he might help me. Again, I did not know God, the Father, or Christ. I'd been active in the church my whole life, but I was a shallow man living a shallow life within the experience of the church. So I went into the water, I came out, I prayed, I asked, I pled. I, I really had no expectation. The day was dawning to an end. I'd never been alone for a whole day by myself, trying to find God. I was certainly humble. I was broken. And so the time was to leave, and I walked out of that area. But what I did not know, I did not know. God hurt me. And he'd been waiting for me to find the humility to find him. On that day, on the 4th of July weekend in 1995, Christ took all of that horrific in. horrific disease out of me. I did not know it walking back to my home, but from that day forward, I would never be the same again, never. And what that did to me, it freed me so, so much to fully appreciate the power of the God that I believed in. I would never have guessed he could have done that. I didn't know he could. Even if I was a good person, I didn't know he could. And he began to teach me and to change me. And in an amount of time, a fairly short amount of time, if someone would ask me, well, what are you like, Edwin? I would say I'm beautiful. Not because I'm great, not because of any great thing I've done because God is changing me into a new person. Again, I didn't know that was a doctrine of the church. I didn't know it could happen. 
And the only witness that is my wife, who I'm still married to for 46 years. She went through that whole process of change, went through all the pain first. It's so sweet to see what God can do to us because He loves us. And so that's why I do what I do. I am not a lukewarm Mormon. And I'm not an average Mormon. The fire of God burns in me every day. I feel His love. I feel His power. I feel Him. I hear Him. And if I can understand what He wants me to do, I'm going to do it. I'm dedicated to the Father and Son. I love them with all my heart. And because of that, I love the gospel of Jesus Christ found in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And because I love, I defend. I love what is taught. I love the outcome. And I see it in hundreds of people that I know who have gone through this experience or are going through this experience, coming to Christ, finding Christ, being changed by Christ, being saved by Christ in a way that seems so impossible to a person who's just kind of coming and going from church. So much more. So that is why I do what I do. I spent a great many years studying the Book of Mormon. I defend it. I defend Joseph Smith as a prophet. The Book of Mormon is scripture. And I love that defense. I love what I'm doing. I love the gospel and Christ. Thank you. Hope to see you on down the road.